Um, thanks very much for asking me to talk today. Um, I'm going to cover some issues around funding and sustainability and, and, and the Wellcome Trust uh, perspective on that. The Trust, very briefly, is a very large uh, charitable foundation which uh, spends about £600 million a year on biomedical research and also engaging the public with science. Um, we have a long-term commitment to building capacity in Africa and we're very passionate about open data and open access issues. So hopefully we'll have something meaningful to say. Briefly, the Trust's open access policy is that all research papers funded in whole or in part by us must be made freely accessible um, from PubMed Central and UK PubMed Central as soon as possible and in any event within six months. So that sounds beautifully simple and in many ways it is, but in other ways it, it is also beautifully complex and I'll, I'll come back to some of the issues that, that people face uh, implementing that a little, a little later on. So in what way do we build sustainability? Um, obviously the key way is through funding and I, I was going to make this point anyway but I'd, I'd really like to stress it now is that publication costs we feel are absolutely an intrinsic part of the research process and you know put simply if we fund you to do research we will pay for you to publish um, in the forum that you see fit and that means covering APCs and we will very much encourage you to do that in fact we will insist that you do that so this costs us around four million pounds a year which is around 1.5 percent of our research budget and interestingly we uh, predicted at the outset from 10 years ago that it would be around that figure and it has remained uh, quite constant so what specifically do we do around building infrastructure? We, as I said, provide dedicated uh, funding to institutions. We participate in projects such as the Europe PubMed Central project, which is a website that is basically a reflection, a mirror site for the U US's uh, PubMed Central, which is a subset of PubMed, and contains full text, articles in an open access format. We work with publishers quite, quite a lot and we have been doing so more and more recently given that we've changed our policy, which I'll come on to, to ensure that their processes assist the research process and support the compliance that we want to see. We try and raise awareness of the benefits of open access in the research community and this is really quite a big advocacy effort and lastly, I should mention that we, well, a journal was recently established called eLife. I should say, I should stop saying we did it. For those of you that uh, follow the Scholarly Kitchen blog and various other um, uh, blogs like it, uh, you'll, you'll know why I'm slightly sensitive about saying this, but this was something that we initiated with the Max Planck Society and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, but it is now very much independent of the funders. So just briefly on Europe Public Central, this, is, um, this has been rebranded, and I'm including this uh, screenshot just to, just to show you what it now looks like. There are some nice features to it, um, including sort of grant lookup tools for our, our researchers and um, some text mining capability that's now been built in. So do, do have a look at that particularly if you're an active researcher. eLife, as I said, is, is now uh, independent of the, of the funders and seeks to really do something a bit different in the publishing space. I mean, there's a lot of competition for this type of thing, but this, this journal in particular seeks to compete with the likes of Cell, Nature and Science, uh, high aspirations, and um, we're very keen to see how that goes. More pertinently, perhaps, this is an example of a, um, a project that we contribute funding to here in Africa, the Southern African Consortium for Research Excellence. I'm not sure how easy it is to see this, but this is part of um, the African Institutions Initiative, which we uh, fund its seven consortia, this is, of which this is one. They're quite complex consortia. I believe there are 
at least three main participants to this particular project with quite a few sort of sub-awardees um, who contribute things to it. But the reason I chose this is, is because very much part of this, you'll see in the objectives, um, it is strengthening comprehensive research management and support systems in the, in the research environment. So a theme that's come up quite a lot over the last 24 hours is the need to support research management and good quality research management within African institutions. And this is one of the things that we're doing to, to try and facilitate that. The compliance rate for a welcome policy is around 55%, which, depending on where you sit, is either quite successful or a, a total failure. Um, the, we, we feel there's still a lot, a lot of work to do. So we, we've decided to introduce some sanctions uh, to increase research compliance, and I'll say a bit more about that in a minute, and we've decided to insist on a new, a new type of license. So the political scene in the UK, um, one of the speakers referred to this yesterday, is very active with the, with the UK government having, having just embraced the idea of um, a very strong open access policy. This is just a graph showing the steady but slow movement towards what we hope will be full compliance one day. In terms of the sanctions, uh, just run through these very quickly. The, uh, we, we, we ask that when someone submits an end of grant report, all the all papers need to be open access. If they're not, we will withhold the last 10% of the grant. When a trust funded researcher comes in for renewal, similarly, uh, we will expect the papers that they put forward to us as evidence of, of their work will be open access. And if they're not, they will have to make them open access. Uh, in order to get the renewal. <coughs> Sounds fairly draconian. I'd like to stress quite strongly that, that, that they're not, and they're not actually designed to be draconian at all. They're designed primarily as a way of changing behaviour. So I said earlier that we were active in advocacy for open access, and really I think this is the result of a recognition on our part that that has not been totally successful. So these sanctions are not designed to be punitive, but simply to make people sit up and take notice and say, OK, I need to do that. And maybe then they will notice the benefits afterwards, which isn't the way we would have liked it to happen. We'd like people to see the benefits first, but if that's the way it has to be, then that's fine. We now require the Creative Commons Attribution Licence to be attached to articles where we pay a fee. Um, this is becoming pretty common currency, I think, in the open access world, and certainly something that I've been sort of trying to push within the trust for a while. We originally thought that I think it was acceptable to to have a non-commercial restriction on um, on the articles, but as time's gone on, I think experience has showed us that this really doesn't doesn't work in certain particular areas. It's now regarded as a de facto open access license. There are issues with the Creative Commons. I don't completely like the way some of it's written myself, but it, it works very well and it is a recognised brand. And I think that's very important. This logo here is really becoming recognised the world over, not just in, in sort of music and media sharing, but in, in literature as well. And someone referred yesterday to the to the economic benefits of the particular the Human Genome Project, and you know, we very much believe that the full research benefit will only be uh, realised when, uh, when, the, when the material is fully open. Briefly for information, this is intended to show the scope of our funding within Africa. So we have uh, major overseas programmes in Malawi, uh, here in South Africa, and in uh, Kenya. Um, as I mentioned before, the capacity building initiatives are a very different type of funding initiative uh, which, which look to increase capacity both in terms of research, most commonly the gap 
that people experience uh, after doing a doctorate and building a career, and uh, also in research management and, and more uh, basic infrastructure needs. So this doesn't add anything to what we've discussed yesterday. The, um, the research picture is um, that there's, there's big variation in research output between countries in Africa and that in a way the research scene reflects some traditional biases and, and, uh, and historical issues. And our view on this is that you know, we can make a major contribution to addressing health and development challenges and there are certain things we need to do to take this forward. One of them is promoting gold open access. Um, again, we feel that the benefits of the literature will only be felt if the, the material is fully open. Some very interesting and complex discussions that have been held here over the last 24 hours about whether promoting APCs um, in a resource poor setting and the waiver that is sometimes applied affects the sustainability of local journals. And I'd certainly like to sort of discuss that more in the, in the coming days. It seems to me that as a funder there are some issues that we, we can address and look to address and that some without wanting to limit our ambition we, we possibly can't and you know I, I put in that second bracket the things that we've been talking about, about internet access and you know government buy-in for open access across an entire continent. So the areas that I think we can influence and, and, and should try and influence are access to funding, capacity to administer that funding, and the issue about where do people publish and following on from that, the sort of controversial issue about the quality of the research. So in terms of access to funding, I, I talked earlier about our commitment to funding research and to capacity strengthening within Africa. Some funding is there from the Wellcome Trust, but obviously not enough um, to, to fund an entire um, countries worth of research, let alone a continent. But on the issue of capacity to administer, there was much discussion about this yesterday, and Michelle Lomas, I think, yesterday said that there was a big hole in institutions where ideally there would be a neat, sort of joined up line between libraries, research offices, and, and researchers themselves. We're, some, we're funding some programs in this area, such as SACOR, but on a wider level, I think there's something here around us as funders being much clearer about what we expect. And you know, I should point out that institutions in the UK, the US, and elsewhere don't have all the answers, as, as Matt was saying earlier in the, in the, um, in the panel session. The, you know, this is something that really takes quite a long time to, to, um, to get momentum. So, institutions in the north don't have this neat joined up line either. Why? Well, it is very complex. I said earlier that our, our policy was beautifully simple, but let's take as an example the journal Nature. It's a fully compliant journal for welcome open access purposes. Why? It doesn't offer a gold option, but it does allow green open access after six months. But it's a slightly different shade of green that we normally see because the journal will itself deposit the author's final manuscript, not the version of record, note, into PubMed Central so the author does not have to. Not only that, but, good news, the article can also go into the open access subset of PubMed Central, and the translation of that means that it's available for text mining. Because a specific license applies to these articles in nature only, which is so unlike a Creative Commons license that it bears almost no resemblance at all. And I would defy anyone to actually find that license on the Nature website. Right, simple, not really. So there, there are so many different complications and that's only one, one journal, one way of licensing. I think the lesson from this is that 
researchers can be forgiven for thinking that, for example, Nature is not a compliant journal and that they should look to be publishing elsewhere, although in that case I think we, they can probably also be forgiven for going ahead regardless. But what can we do about it? I think we need to get better at communicating and what we require and what journals we consider compliant. We're already doing some things in this space, but we clearly need to be better at it. Institutions need dedicated research staff to understand the complexities. We need to explore ways this capacity can be built. Like I said, we can fund some things like the African Institutions Initiative, but it, it is by, by definition limited. Buy-in from the university is key, but not always present. Finally, and this is the last thing I'll say, the third point I wanted to say around this is, is where, where people publish and why. And I think we need to be better as funders at understanding what the drivers are. It slightly touches on what was referred to yesterday as the elephant in the room, the quality issue of research. And there was a lot of discussion around this yesterday, what is good, what is excellent, what is the minimum standard. And I don't really want to get into that. But thinking about the question another way, as a funder, what motivates an individual to publish in a particular place, and in particular, in a non-compliant journal? Most obviously, it seems to me that publishing in a local journal might better address a public health need that's particular to a region or to a country. An alternative is potentially that the work reported on is perceived not to be of a sufficiently high standard to get into a higher impact journal. But, Again, it seems to me that we need to do better in terms of formulating our guidance to address these issues. And this is something I'd like to explore more in the coming days. There has to be some flex in the system because publishing somewhere has got to be better than not publishing at all. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you.